that good? Yeah. I think we did pretty good. So last week we talked about a lot of things. I'm so glad everybody's sitting down and quietening their voice so that we can all be in unity, right? But I knew I was taking a chance and I think you've done very well. Actually, you've done a stellar job. What I wanted to do is practice what we're going to talk about doing in the world. And by practicing it, then we know that we can do it and we'll be able to do it. It's just a matter of, of God showing up and showing us. Last week, we talked about a lot of things, as I said earlier. It's good to have Solo back. Uh, Brada. It's um, good to have Tom and Candy always here. They're such a couple of encouragement in Jesus' name. <laughs> but what we talked about is how the things of the past keep coming forward and keeping us from moving forward because sometimes we don't believe the scriptures when it says all things will work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. When I say we don't believe it, we believe it, but we don't always practice it. Most of the time we don't practice it because of the pain and because of the pressure and the stress that we're faced with in life. This week I had something happen to me and I was kind of looking and saying, Lord, why did this have to happen? And he immediately said to me, he says, but think about so-and-so what they're going through. Why would you even think about it? this not being worked out for your good. But if we'll focus on the fact that he will work things out for good, if we focus, 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 that that scripture is real and is alive, and even with the pain and the suffering that we go through, there is something that we will gain. So today I, I wanted to, once again, my premise always is we're, we're praying and we're waiting on God to do something, but we're not listening to what he's telling us to do and it's almost like he won't talk to us until we do what he asks us to do. Now, I'm not saying he won't say something to you again. I'm just saying sometimes when he gives us a word, and some of you have received words when you're in your teenage years. Some have, have received words when you're in your 20s or maybe 30s or 40s, 50s, do I hear 60s, and maybe 70s. Yeah, we're going to go a little bit higher because Frank will be 79 real soon, I think. Won't you, Frank? When's your birthday? Oh my goodness, he's going to be 80. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's a young guy. And uh, he was only supposed to be here for a, a month or two, and he's here, what, 10 years now? <laughs> oh my goodness, has it been 15 years? So some of you are wondering, am I supposed to come here? You know, I was just thinking about you guys, Whitney and James, you know, because Jeff and Alyssa are going to, to Colorado, so we should just do a trade. You guys should come here because we're giving them there, so I thought that might be a good idea. But anyway, let's stay focused, Dwayne, because you're one minute overtime already. It's all your fault. So I'm going to take 14 minutes, 11.01. We'll be out of here, maybe, by 11.15. The passage I'm going to start out with is, is this is Jesus. Spoke these things and declared in the end, he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So we know we're supposed to be doing what Jesus wants us to do. And then we're going to have a scripture about what Paul kind of recommends. We're going to stay very simple. We're not going to pile a bunch of things on us. We're just going to have a little things that God wants us to do. So if we look at Luke 4, 18 and 19, this was Jesus coming back into Galilee. Excuse me. He was, yeah, and then he went up to Nazareth. 
and like he always does. And what I like in the scriptures before there, it says he came with, with power to Galilee. So it's like he came with power, and that's what we want to make sure everywhere we go, even outside, we want to go with power and insight from the Holy Spirit. But here's what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery aside for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I would like for us to declare that this year is the day, year of the Lord that we need favor. With all that's been going on, all that's going on around the world, we need God's favor in our lives so we can represent him well and not semi-well. I think I just made that word up. But really what I'm looking at is that this is what Jesus was saying that he's reading from the book of Isaiah, from the scrolls of Isaiah. What's the chance of him coming into the, the temple and they could have given him any scroll and they gave him this one and he read it. And when he was finished, he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. But what Jesus was commanded or what was called to do is exactly what we're called to do. And because of time, I can't go into a lot of detail, but just think of the nuggets in this scripture that, that the Lord might want you to deal with, whether it be the poor, whether it be prisoners. And, we can, and I don't think there were prisons back in his days, so I think it's people that were in prison where things were going on, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, release the oppressed, release the oppressed, release the oppressed. Because there are a lot of people who are oppressed and they certainly need the Lord to minister to them strongly in, in Jesus' name. So the second passage is the scripture from Philippians 4.9. Yeah, you just keep singing, that's all right. I get it, I hear it every night with my grandkids, so... Philippians 4, yeah, you laugh, but it's the truth. <laughs> what I like about this passage, the, the passage is the first two, two lines, and then what's afterwards is what he said before. So when Paul was speaking what he said, he said what, what's behind, and he gives us the hints of what he wants to do. Sometimes you think we want to do, similar to what Cayenne was saying, we, we don't want to do to do. We don't want to, we want to be to be, but we want to do what he tells us to do and not just go do something because we want brownie points with God. So it says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put to practice and the God of peace will be with you. So what we did today, we just did a little exercise of going to someone and give a word of encouragement, a word of prophetic word a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. It could be anything. This is what the Lord, this is 1 Corinthians 12, and I think it's in verse 14 to 17. It talks about the nine gifts, and God wants us to have these gifts in our lives only because he wants to use them at certain times, and if you don't have that gift, it's going to be difficult to be able to allow someone to see the goodness and, and, and blessing of the Lord. But what do you see in verse 4? It says, rejoice in the Lord always, and then he says, again, I say rejoice. Then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. So what are you making evident to all the people? Hey, Hugh, I didn't see, no, you were here. What are you doing to show your gentleness to others? Or what are you showing to others <laughs> and that you maybe shouldn't be showing? Uh, don't be anxious about anything. And of course, we know the scriptures that go on to tell us don't be anxious for nothing, but everything give thanks. But then it goes on to say, don't be anxious about anything. Pray, petition, and give thanks. So what I want to encourage you to do is pray, but some of you have given up on your prayers because he has an answer. Once again, he may not be answering yet because he still has already spoke to you about something. He wants you to, to take care of this situation, and it doesn't necessarily mean sin. It may just be obedience to what God wants you to do. And when you do that, then, then he can. But he wants you also, the last thing is, is pray, petition, and give thanks. And don't give up. Because the scripture says, knock and keep knocking, and the door will be open unto you. It says, ask and keep asking, and seek and keep seeking. So we need to be tenacious in our approach to God and toward God. 
This is let the peace of God guard your hearts. Isn't that a novel idea that we would let peace guard our hearts? But when things are coming at us, and I know quite a few of your situations, it's not very peaceful. And you say, well, how is this going to work for my good? We don't need to be asking that question. We need to continue to petition God that, Lord, help me to rejoice because you're in this situation with me. We, Lord, let me give thanks because I know that you're going to give me an answer. And it's going to be the one I need and the one that I can really do a diff make a difference in this world. So let the peace of God guard your hearts. Anybody need to hear that? Let the peace of God guard your hearts. And then the last thing is think on what is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Now what Paul was saying, if we do these things, right, and that's a bunch, it says go back to, the, to verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. Do, are you with me here? The God of peace will be with you because you're putting into practice the things I've told you to do. So I'm not, it's not a commandment, it's not a condemnation thing, it's not dropping something heavy on you, he's saying just, hey, would you do what I've asked you to do? And if you don't know what you're supposed to do, we just, we have the opportunity to look in the Word of God every day, and, and all of a sudden, boom, there's something he's asking us to do. Whoa, seven minutes. Hansel Freinock says this, and i got to get my glasses. This is, I just read this in a book, and it just, it just took me back because it's really what's going on in our world today. It says, people are hurt and, at and afraid at a subtle psychological level and therefore are self-absorbed. I couldn't get away from that. So therefore, they're self-absorbed. We need to understand that a lot of people in our world that we want to reach for Christ, they're self-absorbed in whatever is going on in their life so much that it's hard for them to put, but I'm getting ahead of myself. They're, they're, it's hard for them to, to receive anything because of the perspective they're in. But it says, therefore, they're self-absorbed, incapable of taking on larger perspectives and incapable of acting upon the very long-term risks that are threatening our global civilization. So when you look at this, you realize that you would love to share Jesus with others, but yet it's difficult to share Jesus with others. Why? Because they are consumed with what? With themselves. They're absorbed, self-absorbed, but much of it is very difficult situations. So it's as if they can't take on anything else. However, if you bring them what they need, which is love, which is peace, which is gentleness, which is kindness, and all, joy, all these things, then things happen. But Dwayne, stay with your quote. Okay. We must at all costs make the world population much, much happier in the deepest sense of the word. Let's return to the main argument. People are hurting as hell. It matters. We should do something to make them happier if we can. Now what this author is saying, you say, where's that in the scriptures that we're supposed to make people happier? No, it's just the fact that he's, he's just saying, look at what's going on. They're self-absorbed with all this stuff and they can't receive the peace of God, they'll be happier if you can bring something to them that will help soothe their pain and, and take them to another place. And, they, and this happens, there was a, a leader, a, a pastor from Montana, he was speaking in Portland, Oregon, and he was doing a talk to a group of people, actually it was a YWAM uh, gathering, and he was talking to this one guy, his name was Sasha, he was from, and he says everything, he said he saw a blank on his face, and he even came up at the end of one of his sessions and said, I don't believe anything that you said that you said. <laughs> I don't believe anything what you said. So anyway, that night they went out to practice what they were listening about, and Sasha ended up with this leader. And sure enough, he says, I don't really believe anything's going to happen tonight. He says, well, I feel God's told me that there's, we're going to have two miracles and we need to pray into their lives, and that's going to happen. Obviously, he was in belief, but the first two girls that they bumped into, he said, can we share Christ with you? They said, we don't speak English. He says, well, what do you speak? He said, Russian. Oh, well, we got Sasha. He speaks Russian. So he began to interpret for the guys. The Lord dropped something in his spirit. It was said, one of the girls, he says, was just in an accident, 
and there's an injury, and she needs to be prayed for and, and be healed. So anyways, he, he asked that question through Sasha, and, and they said, yeah, I had a, a car accident last week, and I still have pain in my neck. And they laid hands on the, the girl. The Lord healed them. They gave their lives to Christ because someone brought peace. They brought joy. They brought an answer. They brought a solution. They didn't preach a message. They didn't tell them they're going to go to hell. They don't change their ways. They came in, in love. And what that was was a divine appointment. I could go on and tell you about the others, but it's not necessary because we're out of time. So, and I know what that means. But reality is, is that Sasha's life was changed. And he says Sasha is still in contact with him, even though he was from Oregon and he's from Montana. They stay in contact to this day because that changed and shifted his life because he recognized God could speak and that there was a miracle that happened. Okay, but can we do it in our own strength? I heard something about flesh sucks. We really can't do it just in our flesh. Oh, or you want to do something nice, you want to do something good. So quickly, because you guys are fast readers, I'm going to say, number one, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. First Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you know that yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit is inside of you. I would like to talk a lot about that, that our, our temple is to be holy, not unholy. And if it's holy, he's going to drop things into our lives and we're going to be able to give them out. Number two, Holy Spirit gives us our power from Acts 1.8a. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. That word is martyrs in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the earth. So we know that God is going to use us just to have what I'm going to call a divine appointment. You're not going out witnessing. You're not going out to win people to Jesus. You're just going to go out and look for divine appointments where that you can give something to someone, whether it be physical because they're poor, a sandwich or whatever it is, or whether it's the word of the Lord, a word of prophecy, a word of encouragement. Number three, Holy Spirit gives us our direction. Do we listen? Do we take that direction? Or do we just kind of sit on it and think about it for six months that turns into nine months that turns into a year? And I want to recommend that we get the directions and now we begin to look for that person that God wants us to share with in Jesus' name. Because those who are led by the Holy Spirit, they're sons of God, the sons of God, the Father tells us what we want to do. Holy Spirit teaches us. I'm glad that I'm not having to just learn on my own and get information, 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 because I prefer revelation, revelation, revelation. But the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send you in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Does anybody need to be reminded of all the things he's saying to you? We all need to be reminded. We need to be reminded. We need to be reminded. We need to be reminded of all the things he's told us about. And you know what? Our passion for the Lord should grow. Would everybody agree with that? If your passion when you first came to know Christ was an 8 or a 9 or some of you hit a 10, what about now? Is it a 5 or a 6 or is it 11? There's no such thing as 11. 10 is all we need to get to. Well, no, we can go to 100. But reality is, question is, do we need to be reminded? Yes, we need to be reminded. Yes, we need to be reminded. I'll leave it at that. And then the last one, I think I already said, teaches, yes. The Holy Spirit guides us into truth. But when he, that's in John 16, 13. But when he said the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Some of us are going to be on that journey the rest of our lives. He's going to guide us into truth. We have partial truth. We have half truth a lot of times. And God wants to give us more truth so that we can take that in and begin to put it into practice. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and will tell you what has come. So I want to finish with just simply saying, oftentimes we hear from the Father, we don't put it into practice. We hear again from the Father, we don't put it into practice, and things begin to get blah. I want us to change that, that thing that when we hear his word, because he's only going to say what he wants us to hear. But some of you have a good relationship with God, and you're a, a son. Some of you have a good relationship with Jesus because he died on the cross, and you remember that. And it's important because he died on the cross for our, our sins, and his healing comes from Jesus. 
dying on the cross for our sins and our healing comes. But look here is that some of us don't have that relationship with the Holy Spirit because it's too ooh, ooh, ooh. And some of you are INTJs and you're not ENFPs. So you're trying to figure it out in your head and I tell you, it won't work. So we need someone up here that's a... Uh, well, we have some people that come up with those other ingredients. So we just pray that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for my wife, who is uh, INTJ. I said I was closing, and I am. Last verse. Well, next to last verse. The prophetic, 1 Corinthians 14, 25. When you read this passage, and if you can go back and read 24 and 25, basically what it's saying that the prophetic, when God, and you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. Do you understand that? Some people think that you got to be a prophet to prophesy. God has given it to everybody, every child of God, that you can prophesy, you can give a word of discerning, you can have discerning of spirits, you can give a word of knowledge, you can give a word of wisdom as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, not because you you're worthy of it. It's because you're just a vessel saying, God, I've heard what you said. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this divine appointment, and I'm going to make something happen. So here's what we got, the prophetic. 1 Corinthians 14, 25 says that when one prophesies to an unbeliever or an ungifted man, guess what happens? Someone comes up, and you share. You're a stranger, and you share what God said. Did you have an accident? Do you have an injury? And they said, yes, a week ago, you have a word of knowledge. See, there's a word of knowledge that comes in. And then what happens? The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So what's going to happen is when we become that messenger, and what if it's just one sentence? Would you stop or would you keep going? Or what if it's a paragraph? What if it's a question? If it's a question, we ask the question, and they answer it, and it gives you more insight, and you go further with that. So I want to be, as the that last scripture, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, just simply says, the men of Issachar who understood the times, and they knew that what Israel should do. I want us to replace, that we're going to be the men of, and women, uh, of Maui, or the islands, or Michigan, or Colorado, or Fill in the blank. We want to be a, a man and women who understand the times. And if I asked, went around the room and got your, your input on what you're seeing and sensing what's happening right now, there's a lot of lies. There's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of, it's a lot of just clouding our brain with stuff. Instead, we need to spend more time with him in his presence so we'll know what is God wanting to do in America. Now, I didn't use one slide... Did I skip one? I did? All right, so I'm out of time. And everybody said, thank God. <laughs> Divine appointments, can you bring that up? You guys are fast, so just read them or take a picture. Because a divine appointment often takes place in a very vulnerable moment. Other times we want to be prepared. We want to be godly. We want to be, you know, we want all this stuff. And the Lord is saying is, you may be in a very vulnerable place when God tells you to go. And he wants to see and test if you're going to be obedient. But you might be vulnerable when someone comes to you and you say, stay away. I don't want to hear anything you got to say. And you still there's a, you recognize that there's a vulnerable thing going on. A divine appointment turns out, turns your distress to worship. So God is going to give you a word that's going to change your distress, your pain, and it's going to be turned to worship. At the divine appointment, your perspective is changed. At the divine appointment, your fear makes God's favor. At the divine appointment, God reveals his grace to you. In a divine appointment, everything changes. So, Father, we pray over this church, your body, your church, in the United States, Lord, in the world, that, Lord, we would be like men and women of Issachar, that we would know how to pray. We would know how to give of our time and resources. We would know how to intercede. We would know how to knock on the door and knowing, Lord, that it's going to be open. Father God, we want to be people, instruments, Lord, that we're going to go in. And we go in, Lord, there's going to be people who are vulnerable. One of the, the words that, that Frank 
Ott said, Fryn Ott said, was that people are consumed with their self-absorbed. And Jesus, we need to see what is that self-absorption. Give us words to know how that we can remove weights off, that we can remove hurdles ahead of them so that they can run and know who you are because we're just simply being a friend.